Our reading for the sermon is from Isaiah chapter 53, and we're reading verses 1 through 6. So you can find that in your Bibles at home. God here is speaking to Isaiah and telling him all about the person that he will send to rescue his people. So Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sickness and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of all of us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we start and as we begin to hear what God has to say to us, please join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and pray that you'll give us ears to hear and hearts to understand everything that you have to teach us today through your word. And we pray that you might use your word to equip us for the good works that you have prepared for us so that we may grow in our faith and love and knowledge of you. Amen. So heroes seem to be all the rage at the moment. Heroes are the subjects of some of the biggest grossing films of all time and they just keep making them. Woolworths is giving out cards and stickers celebrating all our Olympic heroes. And most people who I meet seem to have a personal hero, someone they can look up to and be inspired by. Well, what makes a good hero? Well, most people would say that a good hero needs to be strong, fast, intelligent, inspirational. And if you were God and you needed to pick a hero to save your people from slavery, what kind of person would you pick? What kind of hero would you choose? A superhero? An everyday hero? Or maybe if you wanted to appeal to the tween market, you'd choose an anti-hero. Well, here in Isaiah 53, we see God. He's talking to Isaiah and he's describing exactly the type of person that he is about to send in order to rescue his people from their slavery. What kind of hero is God going to choose? Well, he's not. The first thing we learn that God's servant, his chosen hero, he's not a hero. He doesn't have a great, marvelous backstory. He doesn't appear in a blaze of light or riding a white horse. He grows up like a young plant. He grows up in a normal household. He doesn't appear from nowhere. He just grows up like a normal person. And then in the rest of verse 2, God explains exactly how unimpressive this servant is. And he doesn't have a remarkable appearance. Nothing about him would immediately draw us to him. This stands in stark contrast to many of Israel's kings, particularly their first king, King Saul. You see, King Saul is regularly described as someone who was taller than the average Israelite, someone who was very handsome, good-looking, strong, and ready to lead an army in battle. But the thing is, Saul was a pretty horrible king. He led God's people away from God and didn't follow God himself. So being strong and handsome as a king, 
is normally not a good thing in the Bible. But here, God's chosen servant is unremarkable, plain, boring. What's going on? Who is God choosing? Now, one of the first things people notice as we read this passage is that it's all in the past tense. Why is Isaiah talking in the past tense about something that's going to happen in the future? Maybe he's just getting mixed up and he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, this is actually something that happens quite regularly in the Old Testament when it's talking about prophecy. You see, the prophets knew that when God said he would do something, you could be 200% sure that it would happen. And so they decided to write about it as if it already had happened rather than something was happening in the future, just so that you could be sure that because God said it had happened, it will happen. So that's why it's all in the past tense, despite the fact that it's talking about someone who hasn't arrived yet. But then God moves on and starts to tell Isaiah the servant's job description. He will be struck down by God, pierced for our transgressions, punished for our peace. This doesn't sound like the actions of someone who's saving God's people. Everything about this servant is counterintuitive. They save God's people by being beaten, killed. The servant is weak instead of powerful. He is killed instead of triumphant. He is despised rather than honoured. God is not working through your typical hero. This doesn't sound like a very enviable task. So who is Isaiah talking about? Who is this servant? Who is God sending to do all this? Well, in the first instance, Isaiah is probably talking about one of the many kings of Israel. Lots of them sacrificed themselves and underwent great punishment in order to protect their people from the scourges of the Babylonians during the war. But these kings only partly fulfill what Isaiah is talking about. They are only a shadow pointing us to something greater, someone greater who will come. You see, this is pointing us to the day when God the Son himself will step down into our world, join us in our life, and take the punishment that our rebellion against our Creator so rightly deserved. He will be punished for our peace. When God the Son came and joined us in this world, it wasn't very impressive. He was born in a stable, grew up as a child in an occupied country in a backwater area of a bit of a nothing country of the Roman Empire. He grew up normally. There was nothing particularly impressive about his ministry. From a worldly point of view, he was rejected by the religious elite. Not many people listened to him. He hung out with all the wrong sorts of people. And his closest followers and associates were uneducated fishermen. He was beaten by the Roman guards, mocked by the crowds, abandoned by his closest friends rejected by the political leaders of the day. And ultimately, he was left to die the shameful death of a criminal on a Roman cross, a death so horrific and shameful that it was reserved for only the worst criminals. In fact, no Roman citizen could ever be crucified because it was considered that humiliating. Yet this is the one that God is using to save his people. How does that work? But it's in this weakness and humiliation that God says, the punishment my people deserved for their rebellion has been paid for. In the death of Jesus on the cross, All of our sins have been paid for. Our punishment has been received, not by us, but by him. And then in his resurrection, he grants us new life 
so that we can live and come to God no longer as his enemies, but as his beloved sons and daughters. This isn't what you would expect if you were planning to save your people from their enemy. If I was doing it, there'd be white horses, there'd be flashes of thunder and lightning, great blinding lights. But God does it through the suffering of his servant. And that is how we are healed. God the Son comes to earth. He lives with us. He shares our pain. Isaiah and Matthew both mention that Jesus bore our illnesses. He does this not because he got sick all the time, but in the same way that a doctor or a nurse might. They live day in and day out amongst sick people, working with them, tending with them, just as Jesus did, meeting sick people day after day, seeing their grief, feeling their pain. He knows what it's like to suffer. And as we read this and we go, why would God choose to do this? Why would God through work through such a humiliating death? Why would God work through a suffering servant? And we think that until we remember that actually, this is how God has always worked. Jacob was a lying cheat and God used him to become the father of the Israelite nation. Joseph He was an arrogant know-it-all, but God was able to use him to save his people from famine by helping him to gain power in Egypt. Moses? Moses was a coward, but God still used him to bring his people out of Egypt to the very borders of the land that he had promised to give them. David was a murderer. But God turned him into the greatest king that Israel had ever seen. Peter? Peter was just a fisherman. No formal training. No great learning. But God used him to preach a sermon that converted 3,000 people in one day. God has always been in the habit of using normal people to do his work. And we see that ultimately when God the Son himself steps into our world, not in a blaze of light, not in a flash of glory, but in a stable to die on a cross for us. But why would God do this? Why does God choose to work this way so often? Surely he'd get more Instagram followers if he was more spectacular. Well, As we read from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, we see exactly what is going on. Verses chapter 1, verses 28 to 31 say it like this God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one can boast in his presence. But it is from him that you are in Christ Jesus who became God-given wisdom for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, the one who boasts may boast in the Lord. God regularly uses the weak and the humble to accomplish his purposes, to help us remember that everything we have and everything that we have achieved comes not from our own inner effort, comes not from our great work ethic, our amazing talent, but comes solely from the God who created us. He is the one who gives us everything we have, and he is the one who can use us, no matter how good or amazing we are in the world's eyes. Jesus' death and resurrection is the thing that saves us, not our good works, not our great piety, but Jesus. Nothing that we could ever do could earn that salvation. We could not work our way into God's good books. But that's okay, because Jesus has done all that is required, and all we need to do is trust. But that means that God can work in us and through us no matter who we are. 
God doesn't need us to be faster, higher, stronger, smarter, better. He just needs us to have faith. And he will use us to do what he wants to do in the world. He will give us everything we need to do the jobs that he has given us so that when he works through us, when we look back on our lives and see everything that God has done for us, we say, look at God. Look at how great he is that he could use even someone like me. You see, this is one of the great things about being a Christian is that God's not interested in your resume. When you apply for a job, you write a resume. And the goal of your resume is always to say, look at me, look at me, look how great I am. Look at how good I will be at this job. This is why you should hire me and not anybody else, because I'm the best. God's not interested in that. Because God looks at us and says, I have a job for you. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to be the best, because I will make you good enough. I will work through you whether you are good enough or not. That is just how powerful our God is. Because in the death and resurrection of Christ, God has made us perfect in his sight. And so now he's going to use us no matter who we are. One area that we very regularly fall into this trap, I think, is that when it comes to sharing our faith, When it comes time to tell other people what we believe or what we think about God, we often find ourselves making excuses like, oh, I don't really know enough about the Bible to do that. I'm not articulate enough. I won't have all the right answers. God says, it doesn't matter. I will make sure you know enough. I will give you the right answers. And God in his amazing power will take even our most pitiful attempts to share his gospel with other people and use them in ways that we could never imagine so that when we see the results, we can say nothing but, look how good God is. Greatness in the kingdom of God is found in service, power, is found in giving to others. Victory is found in surrender because God's chosen king has already given up everything for his people. God took his death and turned it into life, took his humiliation and turned it into his everlasting glory, took his defeat and turned it into the ultimate victory over sin and death on behalf of his people. God uses us when we are at our weakest so that we know that the power that works in us wasn't something we drummed up from inside of us, but something that was given to us by God. We don't need to be strong. God will be strong for us. We don't need to be wise. God can give us wisdom. We don't need to be amazing because God is amazing. And we don't need to be perfect because God has already made us perfect. And we don't need to struggle for victory by ourselves because the death and resurrection of Christ has already won the victory for us. Isaiah 53 is a fantastic chapter in the Bible with so much to talk about. It reminds us that it is only in the death and resurrection of God's chosen king that we can have true salvation and come to God to live with him forever as his children. But it also shows us that we don't need to strive to be better than anybody else. We don't need to be amazing by the standards of this age because God can use us no matter who we are, no matter what our weaknesses are. And one day as we look back over all that God has done for us, through us and in us, we will see that our biggest weaknesses are the things that God used to work through us and in others so that we will say, look how good God is. 
So don't wait till you're good enough to start doing the jobs that God has given you because God has already made you good enough. You don't need to worry about being inadequate because God is in the habit of using inadequate people for his great glory. And then as you start sharing the stories with others about what God is doing, we can all join in a great, God is good. Look at what he has done for us. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you use us despite our failings. And we pray that you will continue to do so, that you will help us to not be held back by our weaknesses, but that you might help us to see how you have used us in the past, that we might praise your name without, with all your people. We thank you for using us despite who we are. And we thank you for all that you have done. Amen.